Very few people know that the Sahara Desert has only been a desert for around 5,000 years. In the time of the early ancient Egyptians, it was a lush tropical paradise with more fresh water than all of the Great Lakes combined. Now, this isn't just a fringe theory. There's overwhelming evidence that we have to back this up. First of all, we have cave paintings and fossils of giraffes, hippos, and elephants in the very center of the Sahara Desert. We also have maps from the Roman times, which depict several lakes and large river systems across the Sahara. Finally, we can also see the remains of these ancient lake beds. And as you can see on that chart on the right, these were spread all throughout what we know as the Sahara Desert today. And in the center of Sahara Desert was Mega Lake Chad, which is similar to the size of the entire United Kingdom. So today we'll be looking at both the mainstream and alternative views of how this change happened. And so with that being said, make sure to like and subscribe, and let's get right into it. Now, the first thing that you can realize when you look at a globe of the Earth is that along the equator, this is the most vegetated area on the planet. And this is obviously because there's much more rainfall in this area. Now, if we look into the seasons of winter and summer, we also see that we have monsoons, which are periods of significant rainfall on either the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. But you can also see here that along the tropics is usually where we have these arid regions like the Sahara Desert or the Kalahari Desert or the large desert in the outback in Australia. So the periods of rainfall in the tropics are created by the seasons. And so during the summer of the given hemisphere, that area is going to receive more insulation from the sun and it's therefore going to have a bigger temperature differential with the ocean and it's going to receive more rainfall. So this is the primary cause for what we see in what's known as the rain belts. So as you can see in the picture there, the rain belts are not only dependent on the latitude, and areas of vegetation will have a sort of positive feedback effect that will induce more rainfall. Okay, and when it comes to changes in the climate and changes in seasons over time, these are mostly changed by what's known as the Milankovitch cycles. So for the Milankovitch cycles, you could think of them like this. The first is eccentricity, which measures how circular the orbit of the Earth is, and this changes over longer periods of close to 100,000 years. The next is obliquity, or tilt, and obviously this just measures the tilt of the Earth, and this changes around 40,000 years. Finally, we have precession, which changes the wobble of the Earth, and you can think of this as which hemisphere will have summer at a given time in the orbit. Okay, and this is the one that changes over periods of roughly 20,000 years. Now, because the Earth's orbit is not perfectly circular, the precession will mainly determine the strength of the winter and summer over long periods of time. Either the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere will have a stronger summer depending on the precession, and this is what scientists give credit for causing the drying of the Sahara Desert. And in fact, we can see this in, in the southern hemisphere as well because Regions like the Kalahari Desert or the desert in the outback of Australia are getting more humid and receiving more rainfall during these periods that the Sahara Desert is receiving less rainfall. So scientists have two pretty direct and obvious uh, sources of evidence here. The first is the flux of the dust or how much dust is coming off of the Sahara Desert. And so they notice that in a sort of cyclical fashion, and especially between 5,000 and 11,000 years ago, there was much more dust coming off the Sahara, which means there was a more desert, desertified area, and there was less vegetation to hold in the dust. Now, within the dust, they're able to do core samples, and they are also able to measure the levels of vegetation and pollen within these dust samples. And as you can see here, over a course of 20,000 years, it basically looks like a sort of periodic function, and we can sort of assume that this will continue into the future. And we also have evidence going further back in time. So it all seems very cut and dry. And I think the evidence really points to the theory that the Sahara Desert was created by cyclical periods in the Earth's climate. However, this isn't enough evidence for a lot of the conspiracy-minded folks out there. And so we also have to deal with the theory of that there was some sort of great flood that created the Sahara Desert. Now, the alternative theory that we're going to be looking at today comes from a channel called Bright Insight. And he's basically famous for having this theory that what's known as the Eye of the Sahara, or the Rashat structure, is the location for Atlantis. 
Now, I'm actually a big fan of his channel, and I think he has a lot of good content out there. And I actually think the first part of this theory, um, that that location at least inspired Atlantis, or possibly was an Atlantis of some kind, actually has a lot of good evidence. But when it comes to a great flood destroying all the evidence there, I think it just simply doesn't add up. So, the core of this theory comes from these major erosion patterns that we can see from space in the Sahara Desert. And you can see that these are very dominant, but right away, we can also notice that these same exact erosion features are also present in the Kalahari Desert and the outback in Australia and a lot of other deserts around the world, including the Arabian Peninsula. So that's the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that for this to be true, there needs to be some sort of global flood around the entire Earth. Now, the most energetic tsunamis that we've had in the last 100 million years, of course, come from the Chicxulub impact. 66 million years ago, which was the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. So we're going to be using this to see if a global flood is possible and to see if even a regional flood in an area like the Sahara is possible. So in this paper, the scientists decided to do a simulation of the Chicxulub impact. And as you can see, when it comes to a global flood, the waves only get to five meters tall. And here in this finite element simulation of the actual uh, local area, the effect is also much smaller than you might expect. So moving on, you can see in this local area, the waves do get to around 1,000 meters or 500 meters. But again, this is a wave that's moving through an ocean. So you wouldn't be able to sustain these levels of waves over land because there's no water on land, of course. Now, over the entire Earth, you can see here, the waves don't get higher than around 5 meters. So it's not going to have a similar effect in both Australia outback and in the Sahara Desert. It's just impossible. And also, I should say, earthquakes are almost nowhere near the level of energy as the Chicxulub impact, even mega volcanoes. Okay, now for that local area, you can see even within the Gulf of America, or what's known as the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the height of the waves only gets to around 50 meters by the time it hits the land there. Okay, and again, it, it doesn't go nearly as far once it actually hits the land. Okay, now you can see here, it, it uh, the asteroid hit right at the peninsula in Mexico there. And so those 50 meter waves only went around a thousand kilometers by the time they hit land. And then they quickly dissipated. Now, if we look at the Sahara Desert, these erosion lines go much further than this. And again, there's no water to keep restoring the wave. So it's just simply impossible for a wave from even a chicxulub sized asteroid to go further than a few hundred kilometers. Now, it also sort of gets obvious when we look at the elevation of the Sahara, and you can see that these erosion lines are not following the topographical lines, and they're not flowing how you'd expect water to flow, which would be in the direction of the gradient of the elevation. Okay, and so you can see the Sahara Desert has a lot of different elevations, and so if it was water erosion that we'd see, we would expect to see these channeling effects, okay? And the reason we know to expect this is because we actually have evidence of a great flood type situation in Washington state, in the United States. So at the end of the ice age, we had something called the Cordilleran ice sheet. And this is what formed the Puget Sound where Seattle is today. But there was also a giant lake that was trapped in the ice sheet called Lake Missoula. And when this ice dam broke, it created a massive flood across the state. Now, the reason we know this happened is because of what we call the channeled scab lands. Okay, so it's that orange area you can see there today. And it basically removed all of the topsoil from these regions. And so you can see these channeling effects and what's left over from all of this water erosion, even today, thousands of years later. Now, when we compare this to the Sahara Desert, it looks completely different. And the lines are going perpendicular to the elevation gradient. Okay, so as you can see here, this is on the side of a mountain, and it's, I'm not going to say it's wind, but the erosion is going around the mountain um, and not following the elevation lines, and also not creating any channels. And so this is pretty clearly different from what you'd expect from water erosion. Now, the next piece of evidence for this Sahara water erosion theory is what Jimmy describes as water ripples. 
in the Sahara Desert near the Rashat structure. So, from the satellite imagery, it's true that these do look a lot similar to water ripples. But when you zoom in on them, or you actually go to visit these places, they basically look like sand dunes. And you can see these uh, in many uh, deserts around the world where the sand dunes are going perpendicular to the flow of the wind. Okay, and these are called transverse sand dunes. And you can see a uh, sort of simulation of these. And you can uh, look on Wikipedia and see many examples of these. So I went on Google Earth myself, and on the top is a desert in Algeria that shows uh, similar sand, sand dunes like this. And of course, this is in the Sahara as well, so not the best example. So I also show an example of on the Arabian Peninsula and what's called the Empty Quarter, which is like the biggest desert in the Arabian Peninsula. Okay, now another thing we should mention here is that the Rashat structure uh, is located in this very mountainous and plateau region. And so the only way that water would be able to flow over this area is if it came from a lower elevation. Okay, so this would need to be over a thousand feet tall waves. Okay, now the other possibility is that instead of flowing all the way across the Hara, this was just a tsunami. Okay, but again, uh, we're talking 500 to a thousand kilometers here. And so just like I showed with the Chicxulub simulation, this is basically totally impossible. So we can basically rule out water erosion completely, and we're basically left with just glacier erosion and wind erosion at this point. Now, we're able to possibly rule out glacier erosion based on how old this erosion happened, okay? And we can do this through this site, Emi Kusi, and also this Aronga Crater, because we know when both of these formed, and so we know that the erosion needed to have happened after the formation of these two things. So when it comes to Emi Kusi, we know this erupted between 2 million and 1 million years ago. And Jimmy actually makes an error in his video uh, by mentioning that, that the volcano has been active within around 12,000 years. However, these are just lava flows within the caldera, which is basically the crater of the mountain. And it doesn't mean that there was another eruption that produced lava flows that went out to where we see the erosion today. This is just diatom beds within the caldera. Okay, he also mentions the fact that there is salt in this crater. However, this is also not an evidence for seawater flowing over this region because this is sodium carbonate salt. And there's also geological processes that can bring ancient seabeds to the surface and expose salt that way. Now, the Aronga crater is 300 million years old. And you can also see that uh, scientists have already identified the erosion in this crater as what's called a yardang. So this is basically when wind is moving in a unidirectional field and it's cutting through the bedrock in the same direction that the wind is going. Okay, and so this is basically how the erosion looks across the entire Sahara Desert. Now, when we look at where Africa has been over the last couple hundred million years, the Sahara Desert region has always been very close to the equator. And so it's basically been completely impossible for a glacier to form because a glacier to form needs to be very cold throughout the summer so that it doesn't melt away. So we can basically rule out glacier erosion as well. And we're basically left with wind erosion as the main possibility. Now, this actually makes a lot of sense because uh, we have these Halley cell model, which basically describes the trade winds. And you can see that one of the white arrows flows directly through the region where the eye of the Sahara is today, and we see these massive wind erosion patterns as the wind flows uh, back towards the equator. And of course, we know that there's these features called yardangs, which is basically uh, the bedrock being carved out by wind and particles that are in the wind, and basically over millions of years, this can cause the features that we see in deserts around the world, and especially in the Sahara. And once again, like I said, scientists have already identified these uh, erosion patterns as yardangs. And, and the obvious reason for this is that they're parallel to the direction of the wind flow. So in conclusion, we can basically conclude that these massive erosion patterns are caused by the wind, and it's not really evidence of a great flood that would be destroying Atlantis. Oh, one more thing I forgot to mention is this fact that he brings up this a Mauritania slide feature, which is basically a deposit of sediment that's coming off of the Sahara Desert. 
However, we already know that there's massive amounts of dust that blows off of the desert in this direction. And so we can basically attribute uh, these features to the dust coming off through wind. And we also uh, are able to do those core samples that I talked about earlier as evidence for the pollen and the vegetation. And so it's pretty well understood that this comes from wind erosion. Okay, guys, so when it comes to the Sahara Desert, I basically have to totally agree with the mainstream view that it's just caused it by uh, orbital cycles of the Earth, and then that the erosion was caused by wind. Okay? Uh, however, I do like that Atlantis theory, and I'm probably going to be making a video of my uh, adaptation of that theory in the next few weeks. Okay, so I hope you guys liked the video, and I hope you learned something today. So make sure to like, subscribe, and share. And with that being said, thanks for watching, and have a great day.